after 37, anesthesia and pain control. Anxiety and pain control is the practice of various psychological, physical, and chemical approaches to prevent and treat preoperative, operative, and postoperative anxiety and pain. Anesthesia is a term used for temporary loss of feeling or sensation. Anesthetics are drugs that produce the temporary loss of feeling or sensation. There are different types, uh, different methods of pain control. Uh, there's topical anesthesia, local anesthesia, inhalation sedation, anti-anxiety agents, intravenous or IV sedation, and general anesthesia. So the first thing we're going to talk about is topical anesthesia, and it provides a temporary numbing effect on the nerve endings located on the surface of the oral mucosa. It's supplied as ointment, liquid, spray, and patches. In the office, most of the time, um, it's, it's, it's an ointment. Um, it's like a, a jelly. So if the doctor tells you to apply the topical, it usually means you apply the jelly in a with a kind of like a Q-tip type thing, and you put it in the area where he's going to numb. Um, there, it can be liquids, sprays, and patches. So these are some of the examples of topical um, anesthetic, and this is, uh, they come in little jars, and sometimes they use a contact applicator to place a gel on the oral mucosa, and oral mucosa means basically the, um, the gum. Okay, the after the administration of both the topical and the local anesthetic, be surely to thoroughly rinse the patient's mouth, because even a small drip of, of local anesthetic holds a bitter taste. So this is true. Once the doctor applies the anesthesia with the um, with the injection with the needle, you rinse out the patient's mouth because even the topical tastes kind of weird. It's supposed to have a flavor. It can be cherry, coconut, pineapple, mint, etc. Um, but the um, actual anesthesia the, that comes in the cartridges is very bitter. So you might want to rinse out the patient's mouth. These are also examples of topical gel, which is uh, like a little patch. Okay, local anesthesia. So it was first discovered in the mid 1800s. It has re greatly reduced pain during dental care. Local anesthesia is the agent most frequently used for pain control in dentistry. Local anesthesia provides a safe, effective, and dependable method of anesthesia of suitable duration for virtually all forms of dental treatment. Characteristics of local anesthesia. It's non irritating to the tissue in the area of the injection, associated with minimal toxicity, rapid onset, which means it works almost right away, able to provide profound anesthesia. Okay, so depending on the depth and depending on the location, it can really numb the area. It's sufficient duration of action, so it can last. Two to three hours, it depends. Everybody's different. Completely reversible, which means it'll wear away. And sterile or capable of being sterilized by heat without deterioration. Method of action. Local anesthesia temporarily blocks the normal generation and conduction action of nerve impulses. Local anesthesia is obtained by injecting the anesthetic agent near the nerve in the area intended for dental treatment. Induction time is the length of time from the injection of the anesthetic solution to the complete and effective conduction blockage. Chemical compositions of anesthetics. There are two chemical groups. Ester type anesthetic solutions are used primarily as topical anesthetic. Amide local anesthetics are metabolized by the liver. So each cartridge contains a local anesthetic drug, sodium chloride, and distilled water. Time span of anesthetics. Time from induction to completion of reversal process. So from the time that you put the anesthetic on or inject the anesthetic to the time where um, it completely wears off. 
So there's short acting, which means that the local anesthetic lasts approximately 30 minutes. And like I said, it depends on the depth and the area of where it's placed. There's intermediate local anesthetic, which is lasting approximately 60 minutes. So if it's uh, maybe like a, a, a procedure like a filling, which is only like 30, 40 minutes at, at that, um, that's uh, you can use an intermediate anesthetic for that. And then a long acting uh, local anesthetic, which lasts approximately 90 minutes. And these are for longer procedures like crowns and bridges, where you actually need to um, have the patient numb for some for a few hours. Basal constrictors in anesthetics. So indications for use. Prolong the duration of an anesthetic agent by decreasing the blood flow in the immediate area of the injection, and it decreases bleeding in the area during surgical procedures. There's uh, different types. There's epinephrine, levonorgephrine, and neocobifrin. The ratio of anesthetics solution to vasoconstrictors is 1 to 20,000. 1 to 50,000, 1 to 100,000, and 1 to 200,000. And obviously the one to what, um, the higher, the, the lower the number, the less the anesthesia. Contraindications to vasoconstrictors. Unstable angina. Recent myocardial infarct infarction, which is a, something that happened with the heart, recent coronary artery bypass surgery, untreated or uncontrolled severe hypertension, which means that the patient has a uh, severe blood pressure, untreated or uncontrolled congestive heart failure. Injection techniques. The local and innervation of the tooth or teeth to be anesthetized will determine where the topical anesthetic is placed and the type of injection given. So there's a maxillary anesthesia, okay, which mean, means in the maxilla, we said if something is at its max, it means you can't go any higher. Um, the palatal anesthesia, which is an anesthesia that's placed on the palate, there's mandibular anesthesia, which means it's um, placed in a certain area on the mandible, and then there's periodontal ligament injection, which is, uh, it's basically, injected right onto the periodontal ligament of the, of the teeth or the sides of the teeth. So maxillary anesthesia. Local infiltration is completed by injecting into a small isolated area. Field block refers to the, in, the injection of anesthetic near a large terminal nerve branch. Nerve block occurs when local anesthetic is deposited close to a main nerve trunk. Okay, and this is the injections for their local infiltration, field block, and then nerve block. And you'll learn all these things as you start working with the doctors because they'll have uh, they'll have already like a routine or a process of where they place the anesthetic depending on what where it, what area they're going to be working on and what the procedure is going to be like. So palatal anesthesia, this is a local anesthesia in the palatal area, may be necessary for procedures that involve the soft tissues of the palate. So anterior or greater palatine nerve block and the nasal palatine nerve block. Okay, so this is the greater palatine and the nasal, the nasal palatine nerve block. And let me tell you that these, and these palatal injections will make a grown man cry because these are so painful. So anytime they try to do something like that, the doctor will either press in the area of where they're, where he's going to put the needle, the injection. He'll press it down either with a cotton tip applicator or with the mouth mirror to kind of um, deflect the pain from the area where he's going to put the needle. He can also give uh, these palatal injections if you're doing extractions on the uppers, on the maxillary teeth. Block anesthesia is frequently required for most mandibular teeth. The solution is injected near a major nerve and the entire area served by the nerve branch is numbed. So inferior alveolar nerve block on the mandibular nerve block, the buccal nerve block and the incisive nerve block. So here in this picture, we have the inferior alveolar uh, nerve block, 
there's the buccal nerve block and most of the time the doctor will eat where would really place it here or here like where the jaw opens and closes and then there's an incisive nerve block depending on which which teeth he's working on and if it's not getting numb now the periodontal ligament injection the injection of the anesthetic solution under pressure directly on into the periodontal ligament and surrounding tissues periodontal ligament injection is generally an adjunct which means it's an addition to conventional techniques and this is where they mean by the periodontal uh, ligament injection. They put it right like on the side of the tooth. Um, and this they already do this while they when they have already done some other type of injection, like in the back somewhere. And then they do this and sometimes the doctor will do this. Um, let's say if you're prepping a tooth for a crown and there's a lot of bleeding, what he'll do is he'll make he'll put um, some injection here. Um, and then that'll stop the, the 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 bleeding for a while, so you can pack the cord, or you so you can take an impression, etc. Because with a lot of blood, you're not going to be able to do that. The local anesthesia setup. So there's the anesthetic syringe, the anesthetic cartridges, uh, which are color coding of local anesthetic cartridges, and you will learn these two once you get into the office. And there's guidelines for handling anesthetic cartridges, and then the disposable needle. So this is an example of an anesthetic syringe, which is already set up, and these are the parts. So the part here is this is the needle adapter, and you can actually unscrew this. There's the syringe bottle. There's the harpoon, which is actually it's like a little needle, but it actually looks like a harpoon, like a fishing harpoon. There's the piston, the guide gearing, the spring, the finger grip, and this is where you're going to have between um, like your thumb and your ring finger. And then this is the thumb ring. You'll put your uh, thumb through here and basically the harpoon what it does is it punctures um, the this little rubber uh, stopper that has the uh, the anesthetic has on the back and then this the piston is what's actually going to push it in so this is an example of an anesthetic cartridge and they're made out of glass so this is a local anesthetic solutions are supplied in, gla in glass cartridges it has the aluminum cap the glass cartridge and the glass cartridge is going to have all the information you need to know. It's going to have the name of the anesthetic. It's going to have the percentage and it's going to have a date. So it's very important for you to always look at these dates because sometimes when you uh, have, have just a bunch of cartridges in the drawer, sometimes what happens is you'll put new ones on top of old ones and sometimes you won't see that the old ones are expired. And of course, they'll have a color coded band and these color coded bands will tell you the type of anesthetic it is and the percentage of it um, just by looking at it without having to read the, the glass container. So this is the rubber diaphragm and this is what the needle is going to puncture in here. And then this is the silicone rubber stopper and this is what the harpoon punctures and then pushes inside and that'll push the anesthetic into the needle. And okay, so this is the anesthetic color codes. Um, there's going to be red, green, light blue. There's going to be brown. There's going to be like a tan color, yellow, black, blue, gold, and silver. So the most common ones usually the doctors use are always red or either blue. Um, if it's a person that has heart conditions or they take any type of heart medication and they cannot have epinephrine, you'll ha you'll use the tan ones. Okay, and, but you'll get used to it and you'll see what the doctor actually uses and what he likes to use during certain procedures. So guidelines for handling anesthetic cartridges. The, the cartridges should be stored at room temperature and protected from direct sunlight. So usually you'll have these. In, um, never use a cartridge that has been broken. So every time that you're going to set up a syringe for the doctor, you have to inspect these cartridges to make sure that there's nothing in them, that they're not cracked, that they're not broken, they're not expired. Do not use a cartridge if it's cracked, chipped, or damaged in any way. You will discard those. And the way that you discard of these cartridges is you'll put it in the sharps container because they're glass. Never use a solution that is discolored or cloudy or her the expiration date. So always look out for that. Do not leave the syringe preloaded with the needle attached for an extended period of time. Usually what the doctor will do is once he's finished numbing the patient, he will take the needle off himself and he will throw it out. He'll just leave the, um, the syringe um, to the side somewhere in case he needs to use it again. And never save a cartridge for reuse, which means once you use it, 
you discard you discard it um you won't use it again uh and you'll put it in the sharps container you don't use it for another patient and you some usually never will use it for the same patient either just because when the doctor applies the anesthetic sometimes the um the cartridge can aspirate blood which means that it can suck blood into the cartridge and you don't want to use that again okay so these are examples of disposable needles so the first one that you'll see here is a 25 gauge and uh, this is called the long needle and this usually you will use for lower for lower teeth for anything that you're going to be doing in the mandibular there's a 27 gauge which is considered short 27 gauge long 30 gauge which is extra short and uh, 30 gauge short. So the smaller the number, the um, the longer the needle. Okay. And this is the example of the needle. So you'll have uh, you have the needle end, and this is what's actually going to go into the aluminum cap that the cartridge has, and it has a little rubber piece inside, and this will pierce it, and then the anesthetic will go in through here and out through the tip of the needle. Complications and precautions. Injection into a blood vessel. Infected areas, toxic reactions, localized reactions, systemic reactions, very rarely happens, but it can happen. Temporary numbness and paresthesia. Paresthesia means it's a permanent numbness. The, the patient will never regain um, healing in that area, and that is a possibility. So this is the end of the first part of chapter um, 36. And this will this is what we will be do um, tomorrow. We will be doing the rest because it's kind of long. <laughs>